Our second speaker this afternoon is Robert McPherson from the Institute for Advanced Study, and he will speak on geometry and the fundamental lemma. Thank you. I'm going to describe a joint work of, uh, of Mark Oreski, of Kotwitz, and myself. Um, in, the, uh, in the opening remarks of this conference, this was referred to as the gloomy trio. So, uh, in, in revenge, I'll feel authorized to make informal remarks of my own at the end of my lecture. <laughs> um, so, this, this is work, um, our uh, attempts to, to prove and understand the uh, fundamental lemma Uh, many other uh, lectures, which should, as uh, Tom Hales pointed out, really be called the langland schulstad conjecture. In fact, it, um, um, as I hope to make clear, it seems to me that it should be called the langland schulstad conjecture and, and sort of celebrated with, with a large ca cash offering from some rich <laughs> philanthropist, uh, because I think it's uh, really like uh, some of the other famous uh, conjectures, really quite profound. A measure of profundity is when you translate it into a completely different language, is it telling you something interesting or something that, that, that looks either uninteresting or obvious. Uh, and in this case, it looks like something interesting. Well, um, so I, I'm... I ask your indulgence, I'm not going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to admit, omit many technical details. I, um, I'm, I'm going to sort of talk like a, uh, like a dreams, dreamscape and talk about my impressions but, uh, and say things which are roughly true. But anyhow, the fundamental lemma uh, refers to a situation like this. Uh, um, in our case, we have a couple of groups, G and H. H called the endoscopic group, um, and, and in um, uh, our case, they're going to be, uh, for the case of the fundamental lemma defined over a, a, a function field, um, they share a torus in common, and that torus has an element that we're going to focus on called gamma. And that's, a, uh, that's not quite all they have in common. Uh, if we look at their Langlands dual groups, then, um, then the Langlands dual of H is included in the Langlands dual of G. In fact, uh, in the classical situation, there's an element S, so that the Langlands dual of H is the um, uh, centralizer of S in the Langlands dual, dual to G. So, so, so these are the these are the actors. The interesting thing, as with many aspects of the Langlands program, is that G and H have very little in common in general. Uh, their duals have something in common. There's a map, but G and H are uh, like from different uh, uh, different worlds. And um, I mean, I think that's one of the uh, um, reasons that I. Uh, I uh, think this whole area deserves to be better known among mathematicians who are not in this room, that uh, it's, it's, it's predicting the transition from things that look completely different. And in general, in mathematics, when you can make a transition between things that look completely different, well, something interesting has happened when you have understood why. Okay, so what it uh, concerns about, uh, concern, is concerned about for G and H is, is orbital integrals. So an orbital integral is uh, is a um, say 
uh, and an integral over f. Well, in in particular, one can reduce to the case of uh, where you're integrating a function, which is one on the uh, 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 compact g of uh, f square brackets t. So, so we're integrating the function one on um, uh, on that, and then we're e integrating it over a conjugacy class g inverse gamma g, the conjugacy class containing gamma. That's where that comes in, it, and then uh, g dg. So the assertion is that uh, one of these, uh, some combination of these orbital integrals on g uh, equals uh, some uh, transfer factor, which is fairly simple, times some combination of uh, orbital integrals on h. Okay. Now, um, why does geometry enter in? Well, um, the, the orbital integrals are geometric um, to begin with. This, this orbital integral equals um, the, so, I don't know, let me call this OI or something. Uh, OI equals the number of points in uh, what we'll call X sub ga gamma of F, the, um, the Springer fiber for gamma, this is some uh, uh, subset of G of uh, F round brackets T uh, divided by G of F square brackets T. Okay. And uh, sub gamma just means uh, the part fixed, fixed by gamma. I mean, I mean G um, g of f of t acts on this, and gamma is, after all, inside of g of f of t, and, th and, th and therefore I can consider the part uh, fixed by, by gamma. I call it a Springer fiber. Yes? Power, power series ring. Th this, is, this is local. Um, uh, no, uh, number of points in, no. Um, if it's a finite field in, in this, in this, in this introduction, of course, well, okay, but now, um, well, okay, so this is, this is, this, this identity is, um, is is very easy to prove. It's it's essentially because uh, uh, g inverse gamma g is in uh, um, g of f square brackets t. I know why why people use the notation o for that. Uh, if and only if uh, g g square brackets t uh, is in x gamma. This, this coset is in x gamma. OK, so you just check this. So uh, from, from, the very, from the very beginning, these orbital integrals are counting the points on some variety. Counting points on varieties is, of course, a geometric question. It's going to be fixed points of Frobenius, and therefore, uh, uh, therefore geometry gets in the act uh, from, from, from day one. OK, now, um, so for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to, uh, as Jim Arthur suggested, suppress f and replace it by the complex numbers with, with just occasional comments um, about um, the, uh, uh, the, the finite case, uh, the reason being that I like to draw pictures, and I can draw pictures in the complex numbers, whereas I do not know how to draw pictures of, of, a, of a gadget um, uh, such as this. Uh, by the way, I should have uh, said at the beginning, um, that, uh, because I know, I mean, there are many people who, uh, uh, in the subject, who, who don't want to know about geometry. They want to know whether the fundamental lemma is available. 
Um, so we, in, in that sense, our work does not make it available. Um, what, what we're able to uh, treat is the case where this uh, torus is um, an unramified um, uh, uh, torus and um, gamma is of, uh, well, okay, so that's the case um, in which we have a vision for why the thing ought to be true, which I'll describe, and uh, we can actually prove it, I guess, modulo some, some technicalities about extending some things about equivariant cohomology that are known in characteristic zero to characteristic p. Uh, that may have been done, I don't know. But um, modulo those, those things, uh, uh, we can actually prove it only for the equal valuation case, because there's another um, um, conjecture that we don't know how to prove that, I mean, for the general case. So uh, equal valuation unramified case is where is what a proof co comes up out of this. Okay. Well, now that's a bit, um, um, so. I don't know. At least five people have said they know how to make the corresponding thing. Everybody knows what the corresponding set is in the piadic field, and at least five people said they know what's involved in uh, uh, making it into an algebraic variety. Nobody has done it. Uh, I mean, there are some technicalities there. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I mean, of course, uh, Tom Hale's talk this morning uh, m made it very likely. I mean, this is saying immediately that, that, that the orbital integral is, mo is motivic, at least in the sense of, of counting points in a variety. And, uh, 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 Tom Hale's talk this morning made it quite plausible that the same is true, which I think everybody believes, uh, in, um, in, in, in characteristic zero as well. Okay. Well, now let me go to the complexes and, and actually uh, draw some of these things. So I'm going to consider uh, G as uh, some, well, first of all, SL2C, and uh, gamma has valuation one then the, um, this variety looks like the following. It's an infinite string of P1s. These are supposed to be Riemann spheres joined at, at, at points. So this is the variety uh, over the over the complex numbers and continues on um, forever. This is, this is far simpler than most of them, but not untypical in, in the sense of, of, of structure. It sort of has this um, some, some periodic structure, and it's infinite with respect to that, um, um, to that periodic structure. Now, um, the, so for, for a particular form, uh, uh, real form of this group, um, the, the orbital integral, uh, the, the variety over the real form um, is, is going to be the, the fixed points of a complex conjugation, which looks like this. Okay, so it's going to be one P1. That is, everything, this whole thing gets flipped, and you have that one um, uh, copy of a P1. Okay, so that's one orbital integral. Um, another orbital integral will be the uh, uh, fixed points of a, of a complex conjugation that looks like this. It flips, it fixes this point and flips like that. Um, those, two, uh, um, uh, those two orbits will, uh, uh, conjugacy classes will be stably con um, stably conjugate, and, and, the, and the union of this yellow thing plus this uh, red thing is, is going to be a, uh, a, a, a stable conjugacy class. Okay. Meanwhile, the, um, uh, for the only endoscopic group this guy's got, uh, which is a torus, uh, the, the complex points of the variety look like this, and then the real points are the fixed points of the conjugation that goes like that, namely there's only one of them. Okay. So
So, um, actually, let me make that. Can you tell the difference in color? Yes, some can. Um, so, um, in the original, I mean, I don't want to be talking about this at all. I'm talking about this because uh, I want to draw pictures, and I know how to draw pictures of complex conjugation. What I have in mind is Frobenius, and the Frobenius would, would be a Frobenius that comes from, from the fact that I t had a particular um, uh, group. Okay, so this is somehow a, a um, moral, moral tale. Now, the fundamental lemma says the following. It says that the yellow thing uh, minus the uh, red thing is equal uh, to the green thing uh, times uh, an affine line. So this is in, in the, the calculus that Tom Hales was was uh, uh, describing this morning. Uh, so, for example, if this, I'm, I mean, there, there is an analogous Frobenius situation uh, where everything I've said is true. You, you get a P1 of Q here, and you get a point o defined over Q there. And so uh, then uh, this would have uh, Q plus 1 points, and this would have 1 point. So Q plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 1 times Q. So that's what the fundamental lemma uh, it says in that case, you sort of <laughs> plug, plug varieties in. Um, okay. Now, uh, so the first thing we want to do is to make this look more natural. These, these, um, these numbers, this, this number, plus one here uh, and minus one there, those are um, um, these uh, infamous transfer factors or, 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 or kappa numbers. Um, and we'll have not much chance of proving the fundamental lemma if we have to, to deal with, well, at least, uh-oh. <laughs> In the math? <laughs> the advantages of being tall. So, um, let's see. Um, the first step in this direction is to notice, I mean, suppose we took that infinite thing and divided it by the translations. Um, also say later that this, this translations is essentially the co-characters of the, of the group. So suppose we divided it by this translation. Uh, now we get um, a um, nodal uh, cubic or a pinch torus or whatever you want to call it. And now a complex conjugation flips this side and this side, and the uh, fixed point set now is um, this, uh, whoops, okay. Anyhow, it's both of them. It's this plus this. So, so, so the fixed point set now is the whole uh, stable orbital integral. So, so that's the first comment, that, that, that if you want the stable orbital integral, i.e. the sum of these two things instead of the difference, uh, what you should do is, is uh, um, uh, divide uh, by this uh, uh, lattice. Okay, so everything I'm saying, I'm saying in this case, but it's, but it's true in general. Um, but of course, that's not what we want. We want something which is one there and minus one here. So the idea is to take a Mobius bundle over it. You see, this thing has uh, now this, um, this, this guy has because we've divided by z, now has a non-trivial element of pi 1. And so we can, that gives us a, a, an interesting local system over it, which I like to call the Mobius bundle. So here's the Mobius bundle. It's, uh, it's whatever coefficients you're using, which as in the other talks would be QL in the finite characteristic case, or Q in this case. Anyhow, uh, you have whatever coefficients you're using crossed an interval. And then here you have one of those nodes, one of those lobes, and uh, we're doing the following identification. We identify this going down with this going up. That's the Mobius band up there. And we identify this point with this point. Okay, if we identify those two points with each other, 
we clearly get that thing. If we identify this, we get a local system over it. Now, this is an invariant. This is, an equi th this is a um, complex conjugation equivariant local system. Why? Because look at what complex conjugation did. It sort of switched complex conjugation moves like this. Okay, so I have to lift that to this bundle, and the way I do it is I reflect about this point in the middle, the zero on the central, on the central fiber. That is, I take a point up here to a point down here. So this is the, the, uh, the equivariance, the lift of that. See, it works because um, it's a Mobius bundle, so I've identified down here with up over here. But now, look what's happened with this marvelous bundle. Um, it, the, the complex conjugation on the bundle takes this to itself by the identity, but takes this to itself by minus the identity. See, because uh, if I have two points up here, I'm flipping, and so it's minus the identity. So I get these marvelous uh, langland shellstad transfer factors by, uh, the, by the, what's happening on the stock of, of the local coefficient system. So finally, what the fundamental lemma comes down to saying is that if I take the, uh, the, the trace of, I don't know, Frobenius or complex conjugation on this guy with these coefficients, with these twisted coefficients, then I get the same as I would on, on the endoscopic group uh, on H. The bottom line there was H. So this is, well, except for the factor of Q, which, is, which, which gets to be explained later. At least all these signs uh, come in as the action on the fibers of this, uh, of this bundle. So this is, um, I get to, I mean, this, this idea is due to Kotwitz, therefore I get to sort of advertise it. He, he always says it's trivial, but um, it seems to me that it sort of makes both sides now uh, motivic. We're, uh, Basically, in the general case, which you don't see here, I would be taking the, the um, trace of Frobenius on the, on the H side with the um, same twisted bundle, and I, and I would be comparing uh, the two, and I want their, their, their cohomology to be just the same. You can calculate it in this case. Their cohomology is the same, and therefore uh, the trace, I mean, their cohomology is the same in a Frobenius or in a complex conjugation equivariant way, and therefore, uh, the traces are equal. Okay, so that's the strategy to, to show that, uh, that, the, that the cohomology of both the group and the endoscopic group with respect to this twisted bundle is, is the same. Okay, now, um, uh, see, but we can lift that. There's a map of the uh, actually, it's more convenient to use homology, I should say. Um, see, there's a map of the homology of this, of this, maps to the homology of this. And they're very nearly the same. I can send this zero-dimensional class to this two-dimensional class, and this zero-dimensional class to this two-dimensional class. So I have a map which is uh, beautiful and equivariant with respect to this flipping, which, by the way, will turn out to be the action of a, of a vial group element. Not, not surprisingly, that often happens, this, this, this flip. Uh, and this map is almost an isomorphism. See, it gets all the two-dimensional homology. It maps all of the homology here to all the two-dimensional homology. What's it missing? It's missing a class in zero-dimensional homology. That is, its, it's, its image misses it's a point. I map the zero cycle here to the two cycle here, so what I'm missing is the point. And of course, there's only one point. The point is free to roam left and right on this thing. Okay, well, that is also the general picture. So, um, staring at this, uh, some time ago we came up with the conjecture now proved in the cases I mentioned. Um, 
that there is uh, th there's a map from the homology of the uh, x gamma of h, the thing on the endoscopic side, to the homology of x gamma of g, the thing on the uh, our group side, uh, which is uh, is vial equivariant. Okay, I need vial equivariant. This 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 is basically equ equivariant with respect to the flip in this case. In general, I need vial equivariant because Frobenius is going to be acting with respect to the vial gr uh, vial group. Um, and which induces an isomorphism, passes to an isomorphism when, um, after inverting uh, the, the elements 1 minus a co-root uh, one, mi one minus alpha, where alpha is a co-root of uh, G that's not a co-root of H. Okay. So in this case, um, I, I mean, I, I mean, where did co-roots come from? Okay, I'm going to come back to that. But um, um, in this case, uh, alpha is simply a name for the translation to the right here, uh, i.e., this map from H0 of the, to, to, from the homology of this to the homology of this becomes an isomorphism after inverting translation to the right by one. The first thing that you see about this variety is it, it has this amazing symmetry group of the integers. If I translate to the right by one, it comes back to itself. That's true in general. And uh, the, it's the, um, the, the lattice of co-weights that acts. And um, this is a particular uh, co-root shifting to the right by one. Well, you see, this is an isomorphism after inverting that because, um, you know, if I, in, if I take this uh, and translate it by alpha, I get the same thing. It's homologous to itself. So that's going to drop out when I invert those things. Uh, whereas the two-dimensional classes aren't. I take this and translate it to the right, and there's no way I can wiggle it back. Um, now, there's an algebraic point which, um, which I should make, and this is, well, okay, let's see. Go for it. Maybe first, okay. Um, the trouble with this talk is I wanted to say everything first. Um, the, this, is, this is enough. Um, see, if, if this local system here hadn't twisted, then this, this class would have caused real trouble. I wouldn't have had an, an isomorphism from the point to this thing, because I would have had this, this point would have been a homology class. And um, the uh, uh, and its sort of sweep would have been another homology class. I would have had these two homology classes that were, were up here that were so the so the homology of this is you know quite a bit bigger than the homology of a point. Uh, uh, certainly they're 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 not isomorphic, but my claim is with twisted coefficients, this is uh, isomorphic to the homology of a point. Why is that? that that's because this this class is a boundary because of the twisting of this local coefficient system. This local coefficient system twists exactly around the, the translation. Of, I mean, it's exactly because of the translation that I can uh, make that little cycle. So the way I think of it is that uh, you, these Springer varieties have these mobile cycles and these fixed cycles. This is one of the first things we noticed about them. The mobile cycles that are sort of able to just sort of move, sometimes not in every direction. I mean, it's completely amazing. Some of them will move off in one direction, but not in another. But um, 
uh, and then they have these fixed cycles that are sort of anchored to the variety and uh, don't, don't move at all. So, so the inverting of that uh, keeps the fixed cycles, throws away the mobile cycles. The mobile cycles, however, are killed by the twisting of the local coefficient system. Okay, I haven't yet told you what local coefficient system I'm using, so that, that remark isn't, is, is, is probably not completely clear. But let me, um, I mean, except in this example. But let me just marvel now for a while. So, so very early in the game, we, we, start, we realized that there should be a map from this gadget to this gadget. And uh, where, whereas we didn't have it quite formulated so nicely, we realized that, that it should you know, kill the mobile cycle somehow. But um, we couldn't produce one. And uh, the more we stared at it, the more frustrating it got. And the reason is that these varieties are, I, I mean, worse than apples and oranges. I mean, they have nothing to do with each other. I mean, in this case, you don't see that. I'd have to give you a, a higher dimensional example to see how, how different these varieties are. But, you know, I mean, I remember walking around, I mean, maybe really in a gloomy state, trying to find a correspondence between them or anything that would transfer cohomology classes from one of them to the other and just not being able to do it. But um, so then we made a discovery in pure topology, um, which uh, using equivariant homology, which uh, resolved the issue. And this discovery came about exactly because of the conviction that the langland shellstad theorem had to be true, and it had to be true for a reason, so there had to be something about these varieties. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll tell you what that was in a minute, but I mean, this discovery now has taken off in topology and has a life of its own. I mean, by now there have been about 10 papers that, that, that have been uh, uh, written by, by other people about this. We, we published the topology, um, the, the pure topology paper uh, sometime earlier. The paper I'm describing now is in the process of being written, but hasn't been written yet. Okay, um, now, before I do that, let me tell you about um, um, my favorite subject, and that's the, um, the moment map. Okay, so I'm going to give some, just some constructions of some things here. Uh, following the same principle, I'll I'll give them for complex varieties. Uh, the moment map does not have an analog in characteristic P, uh, so it's just perhaps a private way of thinking uh, about characteristic zero. So in this case, the moment map is the projection of this thing to the uh, real line, just as you see. Um, in general, the way the moment map works is this. Um, you have acting on this uh, variety the um, the compact torus, just the product of circles, p compact acts on uh, uh, x sub gamma over the complex numbers. Okay, so. By now, with that theorem, we're reduced to studying it over the algebraic closure. The, uh, the, the field that we started with has gone away because of the bio group invariance. So now I'm just talking about things that are true over the complex numbers. Uh, OK, well, um, this is the moment map or momentum map from physics. Uh, the way it works is that since, since you have this action, therefore you have the Lie. Uh, algebra of uh, the compact torus acting, uh, mapping to um, the tangent space at a given point to uh, x sub gamma. I guess I, well, to, sorry, the moment maps acts on all of x, preserving x sub gamma. I, I don't want to defend what the tangent space is there. Um, Okay, and um, th this maps to 
the cotangent space uh, of x by the uh, Kähler form. And this maps to the, uh, co to the dual, the Lie algebra. Um, by the adjoint of, the, of, the, of, of this map. This is the derivative of the action, so this is the adjoint. And this maps uh, to back to the Lie algebra by the killing form. And uh, so if I take this composed map that goes around three sides, I have um, this composed map is, is equal to d mu, where mu is this map I'm talking about, this uh, map to the, to the real line. Or, okay, so it, so it maps to, to the Lie algebra of the, um, of, the, of the compact form of the torus. Um, now, this, this map uh, takes, um, has a lot of beautiful properties. Uh, when we when we restrict it to the to the um, to the x gamma, uh, it uh, it takes well um, takes the fixed points. Um, well, sorry, uh, I also have the torus of C. Um, which also acts on this thing. The moment map is, is, is traditionally done with a complex torus. So it takes the TC fixed points to uh, co weights. Okay, you can sort of see that happening here. See here, here I've got these, these fixed points, and they're uh, taken to a lattice by this map. And this is the this is the coate lattice. And the coate lattice also acts on, on this thing and on this thing equivariantly with respect to the moment map. And so it's that action which I uh, mean when I take 1 minus alpha there. And um, it takes, uh, this is true of, of, of moment maps in general, it takes an uh, a a, a j-dimensional uh, orbit, j, of course, complex dimensional orbit of uh, the uh, torus, or the complex torus, to a uh, j-real dimensional uh, sub, uh, subset of, uh, of, of its image. Uh, Compact. That's that's just a trivial uh, <laughs> consequence of the definition here, but it's but it's really nice. So see, I I have these zero-dimensional orbits being taken to zero-dimensional things, and I have these one-dimensional orbits being taken to one-dimensional things, and that um, that that continues on. While I'm at it, uh, let me now tell you what. Uh, role S plays. As I said before, uh, traditionally H was constructed by taking the centralizer of S. Well, S, see, you can consider to be a, a function on these, uh, on these co-weights. So it'll be something like 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1 in this case. And um, so S is what we are going to use to glue together this local system. That was the thing I left hanging. I said, in this case, I was going to use the Mobius bundle, but I didn't say what I'm going to do in general. In general, what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll up the, um, the uh, Springer fiber over the uh, rolled up um, uh, vector space, real vector space. So, so this real vector space rolls up into, into, into a... Uh, in, into a compact torus, and then this, this um, S will give me gluing instructions for constructing a bundle over the, uh, a, a, a bioequivariant bundle over this torus, and uh, that, that's the analog of the Mobius bundle. So uh, 
in the proof uh, that this conjecture theorem is enough to prove the fundamental lemma, then what you need is that uh, uh, in, in the direction of the uh, uh, co-roots that um, are in G but not in H, that the bundle, that this bundle actually twists, that it's not the identity bundle. It has some twisting as I go along there. That's what I needed to make that class go away. That's what I need in general to make the class go away. Um, and that's true just because this H was taken to be the centralizer of S. Okay. Uh, and this picture also somehow explains the, what, I, what I mean by vial and vari vial equivariant up there. I mean, you're sort of used to the idea that the vial group acts on this space. I mean, that's the first thing we teach our students. Um, so it, the, the vial group acts on this space in a way which commutes with that. There are some hard technical uh, uh, difficulties there, but I'm, I'm just giving the, um, the outline. Uh, okay, so now um, we have all this apparatus. Actually, let me draw the picture now for the, uh, the case, well, almost the case that Gerard Lomal was discussing. I don't know. I'm not sure, completely sure it's a good idea to draw this, but it's so beautiful I can't resist, so I'll just do it. So here, uh, this is the case uh, uh, for uh, SP4. He, he was doing GSP4, which gives a slightly more complicated picture, but I'll just do SP4. So we have fixed points, as you might imagine, uh, for the, for the co-roots of SP4. And then we have, um, okay, so these are the, fixed points. And then we have, um, now I'll give the images of the one-dimensional orbits. So um, in uh, green, I'll put in both, um, you, you, let's see, some, some version close to SL2 cross SL2, the center is slightly different, uh, is, is um, is H. Okay, so now in, um, so let me say uh, the uh, one dimensional orbits in G and in H, that are in G and in H, well they form beautiful lines, array of lines like this and so on, covering the plane. And then I have uh, one-dimensional orbits in G, but not in, in H. And they form lines like this. And then, uh, whoops, and then S is going to be uh, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, and so on. So that's the, that's the gluing instructions. Okay, so um, now the point is that this is exactly the, the classification of roots. I mean, I've classified the moment map images of the, of the one-dimensional orbits, but uh, this, this group H is, a, is an SL2 cross SL2. You, you see here I have SL2 cross SL2, and then plus a little bit from the other thing I didn't say, whereas uh, G is an SP4. So I have all the roots of G. What I'm trying to say is that the moment map images of the one-dimensional orbits in either G or H are the root, the, the co-roots, uh, the co-root directions. In, in G or H. So these two varieties, which I was uh, carrying on about how different they are, um, 
are extremely different, but there's one thing they have in common, and that is uh, their, uh, their zero-dimensional orbits are in common. They're in, in both cases, their zero-dimensional orbits are the same things. And the one-dimensional orbits of G uh, are, slight, are, um, are more, strictly more, than the one-dimensional orbits of H. That is, the one-dimensional orbits of H are contained in G, but G has extra ones as well. Uh, these guys. You see that quite clearly here. I mean, if I took my, my, my endoscopic group, I would have these, these points, and uh, the group G has those points plus these uh, spheres. No, uh, no extra GM for homogeneity. Yes, this is, this is just the, the torus contained inside the group. No, 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 nevertheless. Uh, the, um, no, I didn't say there were finitely many. However, it is still the case. I, I mean, in fact, um, there will be infinitely many. But it is still the case that the um, uh, one-dimensional or orbits of G projecting to this gr particular green line will be the same as the one-dimensional orbits of H projecting to this particular green line. It, uh, uh, isomorphic as algebraic varieties with a group action. And then in particular, G will have more. OK. So as I say, we were gloomily walking around trying to figure out how any way to move uh, cohomology from one variety to another, and the only thing we saw in common was the zero and one dimensional orbits, and so this led to the wild idea that that was enough, and that turned out to be the case. So um, uh, just, to, just to tell the, the, the end of the story in, in, in summary form, um, if uh, uh, X has pure cohomology, pure in the uh, sense of, of the linea, then, um, uh, then the, the equivariant, the, the T equivariant cohomology of X gamma is uh, determined by the uh, zero and one dimensional orbits in a way which I uh, w will not specify because I don't have time, but um, in a way which basically is completely algorithmic. You look at this picture, plus the only thing you need to know about gamma is the valuation in each of these directions. So that's going to be some, some, some integer uh, associated to each direction. And then you turn a crank and uh, do beautiful algebra associated with that picture, and out of it you get the, 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 the equivariant cohomology. OK, so this was the theorem which I said that, that, we, that, uh, that we found in topology as a result of uh, trying to prove the fundamental lemma. Then, um, so conjecture, uh, uh, x, gamma are all pure. OK. Uh, it seems very likely, uh, quite compatible with what um, Tom Hales was saying, saying this morning. Um, so x, gamma will have, sure, elliptic curves in it, but that doesn't keep it from being pure. Um, uh, yeah, well, see, that's why I'm taking homology. I mean, it is compact. Um, it's morally compact in the same sense as all the geometric Langlands people are always saying, you know, this. Anyhow, it's finite dimensional, and all that happens, uh, I mean, it's just like, as in this picture, you, you, uh, you have a piece, and then you just add more, more pieces. And uh, it starts being pure at some finite stage. So it's, uh, I mean, it's not non-compact in a, in, a, in a fundamentally bothersome way. Well, OK, you can make, I claim because it's homology, you can make this precise. Um, uh, theorem, what we can prove is that it's pure for, uh, um, Equal valuation. Okay, so this includes those cases with elliptic curves. I don't. This this theorem includes the ramified 
torus case. It's pure in those cases. Um, so then, it, then in those cases, uh, well, then it's um, just a calculation, which I won't duplicate it. And uh, one way of doing it is, is to use the, as, as Gerard was hinting, to use an extra torus when you look on, on, on these things. Um, on, on the uh, part of the one-dimensional orbits that, that, that project here. But there are, there are other ways of doing it as well. In any case, what happens over those things is universal over all groups. It's not as if you get one thing happening in one group and another in another group. It, it's, it's all a copy of what happens in SL2. So you, so you can calculate it easily and then, and then apply the theorem above. The equivariant cohomology determines the ordinary cohomology. But you get a map on equivariant cohomology because you just compare the two calculations, and that passes to a map on ordinary cohomology, and you verify that it has the the uh, uh, the properties that we uh, said. Okay. Um, well, with some hesitation, I'd like to. I don't know if I'll. Well, Perhaps after this, I never will have another opportunity to speak to a, to a group of uh, uh, such distinguished uh, people involved in this program. But I wanted to make a comment. It seems to me that, the, uh, that the, uh, a certain por portion of the elephant, uh, the, namely the portion having to do with um, uh, endoscopy and functoriality of higher groups and so on, is, uh, ha has a, a a uh, problem relating to other fields of mathematics. Uh, people have a hard time um, understanding it. People, um, I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, it's an ex experimental fact. I mean, the Langlands program is so amazing, you know, it says that, 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 that this great motivic stuff that number theorists understand uh, can be gotten out of what, what to me is purely topological stuff on G mod, K mod, gammas. So I've succeeded in getting a number of topologists interested in it, and they say, then, well, what should I read? And well, they can't uh, make any headway with the literature at all. Um, and I, even some number theorists have told me that they have a hard time understanding what's happening. Um, the, the situation strikes me as very similar to the situation in algebraic geometry just at the end of the time of growth and I remember clearly the advice was, uh, you want to learn algebraic geometry, read EGA first, then read SGA. And of course, a few iron people could do that, but, uh, but uh, in particular, geometers can't. Contrast that with algebraic geometry today, where it's used all over. Physicists use algebraic geometry left and right. Low-dimensional topologists, some of their favorite examples are from you know, algebraic varieties. Nobody says, I'd li I think algebraic geometry could help me here, but I don't know how to get into the subject. Well, uh, what happened in between times, some very uh, di uh, distinguished people wrote some uh, less demanding books that were um, the, uh, sort of a way in for people who don't sort of want to learn everything at once and learn the, and, and learn the whole notation. Well, I'm sure historically that will happen here, but um, it would be, and, and I know that there are some uh, very distinguished people here in this room who have made um, uh, tremendous efforts in, in exposition. But um, nevertheless, as I say, when you have a topologist on the street, they feel that it, the, this subject is totally impenetrable to them. And uh, I hope somebody tries to do something about it. Thank you. Comments, questions? Yes, uh, in the function field case. <laughs> what is available? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, Other questions? Well, if not, thanks again. David.